Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Savannah First Seventh-day Adventist Church on this lovely Sabbath day. This is our fourth or fifth week out of the building, and so we've been live streaming our service, and we'll probably keep doing that even after uh, the quarantine is over. My name is Joseph Womack. I'm the pastor here. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome to you. We have a great abbreviated service. I have just a few announcements. Then my friend Chris Corbett, the clinical psychologist, will be back with some more health tips. Then we have the Isaac family leading us in music. Then a sermon, second part of the Health in the Time of Virus series. And then the Isaac family again with the song and prayer. And that'll be it. So if you're in your chair, that's fine. If you're sitting in a pew, maybe you have a pew at your house, that's great too. And uh, if you're standing, you can stand the whole hour. I don't really, it, I don't mind at all. So I just have a few announcements for you before we move on. One is if you are a member of this church and you want to continue supporting this church with your tithes and offerings, you can do it online through our website. You can do it through the app, Adventist Giving, or you can mail it into the church, 50 Godly Way, Pooler, Georgia, 31322. Also include in your offering, don't forget our school and the lambs offering as well, because that's usually something we do is collect an offering for the children. And we haven't been able to do that, of course. Also, don't forget we have the Hope Awakens series through It Is Written that we are supporting. It's online. The next one is tonight at 7 p.m., so go to hopeawakens.com. We had over 250 people sign up through Savannah or in Savannah to participate in that series. So that's a lot of people. 30,000 around the world participating in that. Also, I, uh, one thing, I'm trying to think of ways to engage you with me and the church through the internet. So one thing that, uh, if you've been here a lot or seen me over the course of my uh, career, I've done is what I call the count the words game. So I'm going to give you a chance to play the count the words game today. Here's three words. Every time I say one of these three words, make a note, you'll have to get up out of your chair, your lazy boy. Get a piece of paper and a pen, or you can mark on your arm or something, whatever, or on your phone. Count the words. Here's the three words. Every time I say the word duck, Romans, Zandy, Z-A-N-D-Y, Zandy. So the words are duck, Romans, and Zandy. Every time I say one of those words, mark it down. You can put it in the comments of the church, of this Facebook when you're done, or you can Email it to me or put it on my Facebook or something like that. We'll see who gets it close. So now I'm going to invite our friend Chris Corbett, who is an elder of this church and a clinical psychologist, to share with us some more tips on living a good, healthy life in this time of virus. Dr. Corbett. All right, good morning, friends. Morning. Hope that you are well this morning. For our health nugget, uh, or health minute, whatever you'd like <laughs> to call it, nugget sounds good because it reminds me of chocolate, and that's definitely one of uh, my favorite things to keep healthy. Mm-hmm. Dark chocolate, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, the 85% or better. It almost tastes like dirt, but it's so good. Uh, this morning, uh, what I want to share with you about is a little bit about gratitude. Uh, I don't know what you've all been experiencing while you've been uh, physically distancing. I'm not going to, I prefer not to say social because I think we should be connected to each other. Uh, And I'm going to foster and support that any way I can. So I'm going to, I might refer to it as physical distancing. Um, But anyways, I want to talk to you about an attitude of gratitude. Uh, Because I know for something that I've been experiencing over these last couple of weeks that have maybe stretched even to a month or so at this point. Uh, is it's really important to be aware of what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling, especially for those around me. And I want to pass that along to you all and encourage you and challenge you a little bit this morning. So if you don't know about gratitude, I hope you know a little bit about it. But it actually originates from the Latin word gratia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, And it actually means grace or thankfulness. Uh, And so that's definitely something... Uh, to keep in mind. It really links to what we're doing. Um, And on my next slide, uh, we're going to give you some examples of the benefits of gratitude. And this is not stuff that Dr. Corbett made up. Uh, This is stuff that's on the internet, and so it's real. 
Uh, it's actually in research <laughs> uh, for those that are interested. And I can even share the links with you if you'd like that as well. But a couple of things about the benefits of having a gratitude-filled uh, spirit. It helps us acknowledge the goodness that's going on in our lives. So I don't know, it, it encourages us to look for the positive things. And so often it's easy to kind of get discouraged and to just notice the things around us that maybe aren't exactly happening like we'd like it to. But gratitude really helps us shift our perception. And the funny thing about it is when we're looking for it, we're also more likely to see it. Another thing uh, is it gives us an opportunity to look beyond ourselves. In this world, it seems like so often in the world of social media and all these things that are going on, we're focused on ourself. One of the things I connect to most about the Christian faith is it does the exact opposite. It encourages us to look beyond ourselves uh, to our friends and our community, and I think gratitude does that as well. It also helps us to be happier uh, because we're looking around, whether it's our neighbors or it's our friends and our family, perhaps, that we're spending a whole lot of time with right now. It helps us to remember and be happy about those things. Uh, interesting things about research is people that have an attitude of gratitude are more likely to exercise more. Uh, and then as a result of that, you might imagine, they probably go to the doctor less. And it's not because they're avoiding the doctor. It's because they're physically healthier. It also really improves our relationships. I don't know about you, but for me, when, when I'm around people that appreciate me and I can appreciate them back, for some reason I want to hang around them more. Uh, and I find myself wanting to grow and give that fruit back to them that they're sharing with me. And then lastly, of course, an important thing, especially as we are feeling a little isolated, is it can help us reduce our stress. And with mental health stuff like depression or anxiety, it can also help reduce that as well. So in that same vein, I want to challenge you on a couple of things this morning, and I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I'm grateful for. Or actually, before we do that, I want to uh, ask you or encourage you a couple of things to do to practice gratefulness. So I don't know how many of you write anymore. You probably only use your thumbs uh, on your devices as you're texting. Uh, you might type on a keyboard every now and then. But for those of you that don't, I want to encourage you to write a note, write a thank you note, put it in the mail, slap a stamp on that. Let's help keep our friends in the U.S. Postal Service employed during all this time. Send a handwritten note to someone that you appreciate. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gotten one of those. I get those from time to time, and they are really powerful. So practice that. Send that back out. Another thing is to practice it out loud. So say it to your family. Uh, act it out. Do lots of different ways that you can do that. Uh, you can even yell at your neighbors across your fence if you have a fence or across the street. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can connect with each other. We don't necessarily have to be physically close to each other. Foster it in your families, in your communities. One thing that I think is really great to do, especially as a family or whoever you live with, is be intentional. Build this into your day. Around your dinner table or your lunch table, you're probably eating every meal with them right now. So you could do it at every meal if you want to do it. Ask each other what you're grateful for. Express some gratefulness to them or find something in your day that you've been grateful for that you can share and do with each other. And then remember, lastly, it takes practice. It's a muscle. It's not always easy to be gracious and to have gratitude. But if we build that muscle, it's easier to do it and it'll get stronger. Uh, so let's practice on building that muscle and I want to practice this morning by give you a couple of things and to also demonstrate it can be something big, but it can also be something tiny. Like, for example, I've learned that I'm really grateful for the person that cuts my hair. Okay? Her name is Paige. I don't know if she's watching, but I'm going to call her out and thank her anyways. She cuts my hair very well, and I'm really grateful for that, especially right now because I'm feeling the pain. The next thing is I'm grateful for the time I've been able to spend with my family. I have found the opportunity to spend a whole lot more time with them. And like you, I'm sure, I think they're pretty fantastic people. And I get to eat more meals with them. Uh, I don't have to worry about commuting to work. And that's all additional time that I'm able to spend with my family. And I'm really loving that. It's also reminded me almost every day about the things that are truly important. There's a lot of things that easily clog up my life personally. I don't know if the same thing happens for you, 
Um, but with a lot of those things kind of stripped away right now, it's reminded me of the things in my life that are truly important to me. And it also, because of what I don't have access to, it helps me remember or think through, is this really something I actually need? Either because it's not available or maybe we don't have the money for it, uh, those various kinds of things, it really helps that. And then lastly, but not the only thing, is I really like to cook, but because of commuting to work, I don't always have the chance to do that. So the chance that I've been able to cook more for Beth uh, and the kids is definitely something that I've appreciated. So just some things to think about this morning as you're sitting at home or if you're watching later with us on a recording, I just want to encourage you this morning, let's all do our part to be gracious, to have that attitude of gratitude. And lastly, if you think it's just an idea, it's chock full all over the place in the Bible. So I want to leave you with a biblical verse of inspiration this morning. Um, and it says this, let the peace of Christ keep you. Well, I can't read it. I'm going to have to do it this way. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing and cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Hopefully that's a word of inspiration for you this morning. Uh, I know that I'm about to be inspired because the Isaac family is going to come up and sing with us. And I'm so excited that they're here with us this morning. So again, thank you. I hope that you are doing well. We love you. We appreciate you all so very much. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Isaac family to come sing with us. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to our praise and worship. Our God is a wonderful God. We give him all the praise. We also know in our hearts that he is our maker and king. So our first hymn will be number 15 from the hymnal, My Maker and My King. My maker and my king, to thee my all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. The creature of thy hand, on thee alone I live. My God, thy benefits demand more praise than I can give. My God, thy benefits demand more praise than I can give. Lord, what can I impart when all is thine before? Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift of last outpour. Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift of last outpour. Oh, let thy grace inspire my soul and strength divine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Our next song in the hymn is number 92, This Is My Father's World. One, two, three, four. 
This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white. Declare their Saviour's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fear. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me near forget. Though the wrong, the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. Our hymn of meditation will be hymn number 334. Hymn number 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me ever to adore thee Make me still thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my joy and joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering through the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind me closer still to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We now pray. Dear wonderful and heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath. We thank you for your blessings, your love, your kindness to us, dear Father. We thank you for being with us and protecting us and keeping us safe. We ask you to forgive us of all our sins, renew our spirits, and guide us, dear Lord. Be with our church family and everyone, especially in this time of crisis, dear Father. We know that you are there with us, and you will comfort us always, dear Father, and we thank you so much. We ask you to be with our pastor as he presents the, best, the sermon to us. Bless him, and may, he bless, may the Lord bless us 
through his words, dear Father. Guide us always and help us remain faithful until you come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Isaac family. Good choice of songs, good music. So good morning again to you. If you've tuned in since I did the welcome, I'm Joseph Flomack. I'm the pastor here. We're in a four-week series that I've entitled Health in the Time of Virus. This is part two. I'm going to reflect on how we maintain our health, not just our physical health, but our spiritual health, our mental health, emotional health, and physical, mental health remain whole during this time of virus, which has put a lot of stress and anxiety and danger and fear into our lives and our hearts and our world. These are strange times that we live in. I was talking to a friend this morning, and his wife has to have surgery Wednesday, and he will be unable to accompany her to the hospital, and she's afraid of hospitals, and so he's very anxious about that. These are very real problems that people are facing. You might be experiencing some of those too. So last week I talked to you about part of a healthy faith is that it is based on the real world, that you, you face the world as it is, you accept the world as it is, and you deal with it and realize that God doesn't remove you from this world, but he walks with you through this real world. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because thou art with me. Psalm 23 verse 4 seems to be a verse that speaks to that. So today I want to talk to you that not only does God call us to have good health in a real world, but God calls us to appreciate and embrace our individuality, our uniqueness, that he has made each one of us uniquely wired to serve him. That's the message. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining to you what I just said to you in 20 seconds. So there was a flock of wild ducks that were flying in formation, and they were headed south for the winter. As people looked up from the ground to the sky, they saw this beautiful V of ducks in a row flying south. One of the ducks' names, strangely enough, had a name. His name was Wally. Wally was flying in the formation. He spotted something on the ground that caught his eye. It was a farm. And in this farm, as he flew over, he saw some other ducks down there, tame ducks, quacking, walking around the barnyard, waddling. Not only were they quacking and waddling, but they had corn being thrown on the ground for them by a farmer, just eating whenever they chose to eat. Wally liked what he saw. And he said, it sure would be nice to have some of that corn. And all this flying that I've been doing all day is very tiring. I would just like to waddle and eat for a while. It sounds sort of like me during this time of quarantine. A lot of waddling, a lot of eatling. After thinking about it, Wally decided to join the barnyard duck. So he left his V formation in the sky. He made a sharp dive to the left and he headed for the barnyard. He landed among the tame ducks. And he began to waddle and quack and then eat some corn just like them. The formation of wild ducks continued south, but Wally didn't care. He wasn't worried. He said, I'll rejoin them when they go back north in the spring. Months went by, the winter passed, and sure enough, Wally spotted his wild duck friends heading back north in the same V that he had left a few months ago. And it looked beautiful. He was tired of the the barnyard. It was muddy and everywhere he waddled. There was nothing around him but duck dew. It's time to leave, Wally said to himself. Wally flapped his wings furiously to get airborne, but he had gained weight from his corn-eating, waddling days, like being in quarantine. And he had an exercise, so he barely got off the ground. And just as he was elevating a little bit, he hit the side of the barn and slammed to the ground. Oh, he was okay. But he still, his, his pride was hurt. As he watched 
the wild ducks flying back north, he said, I'll just wait till they fly south again in a few months, then I'll rejoin them and become a wild duck again. But when the flock flew south the next year, Wally again tried to get airborne, but he didn't have the strength. Too much waddling, too much corn, too much barnyard fun, I guess. He called out to them, whack, whack. But they didn't hear his quacks for help. As time went on, eventually Wally didn't pay any attention to the wild ducks flying overhead. He hardly noticed they're going south or they're going north because he was now officially a barnyard duck. You see, Wally had lost himself in the crowd. He had He had been a wild, strong, high-flying duck, but by misplacing what made him what he was on the inside and not doing the things that had made him what he was, he became domesticated and he, he drifted from what he once was into something that he had never imagined he would be. So let me ask you a question. Question. Do you ever fear... Losing yourself. Do you ever fear losing who you are as an individual? The things that make you, you. Your passions, your interests, your desires, your goals. Somehow that all gets taken away or shoved to the side and you find yourself blending in with the crowd, doing what they do when they do it. So much so that for one day you wake up and you are not where and who and what you thought you once were. You've become something else. You've gone from being a wild duck to a barnyard duck. So I'm left with this truth. Wild ducks can become tame. So this series is entitled Health in the Time of Virus because we are living in these unprecedented times of COVID-19, of fear and Social, as Dr. Corbett mentioned, physical distancing, disconnected patterns of behavior, worry, and trying to do what's best for everybody. And these times make me reflect that sometimes as you try, your focus gets shifted to other things, that your faith can get shoved aside. Your faith in God and your health. And it gets left unattended. It can grow domesticated like a barnyard duck, unable to fly high like God intended you to. And your faith can become unhealthy. So an unhealthy faith, an unhealthy walk with God calls you to be more like a barnyard duck, let's say. To become like everybody else. To not pursue your dreams. To not get sweaty in your pursuit of what fires you up to not persevere, to not dedicate yourself to the things that make you who you are, but just sort of get involved in this whole group think, being passively fed on corn. Not doing it on your own, but each doing the same thing. Everybody's just quacking the same tune. Come on, preach. <laughs> so on, in week two of this series, I want to focus on a healthy faith. To be who God called you to be as an individual. To be uniquely you, gifted and empowered to serve like no one else. Have you ever thought of that? That God has wired you and filled you with experiences and personality and likes and dislikes and a way of thinking that makes you uniquely you. There is no one else like you in this entire world with your combination of attributes and skills and strengths. So a healthy faith allows us each to be an individual and unique in our own way. Now God is big enough to love us each individually. He calls us individually. He works with us he works with us each individually and he walks with us through life individually despite our character flaws, despite any bad mistakes we've made in the past, any shortcomings we've done or any weaknesses we have. A healthy faith allows you to be an individual and unique in your own way. Now, I think for those who are outside the church, 
it appears that those inside the church are all motivated and encouraged to be and to think like each other, to be all the same, to be more uniform than to have unity in the midst of diversity. It can be a barrier to ending the church. People feel like, well, if I go into that group, if I give my heart to Christ, if I decide to follow that Christian lifestyle, I'm going to have to give up on me and be like everybody else. I had that fear. That was one of the things that I was even able to identify myself before I became a Christian. I didn't want to lose my individuality. I didn't want to have to say and do all the same things that everybody else was saying and doing in the church. I wasn't all I knew I could be before. I knew I had room for improvement, but I actually liked myself. I liked the person I was. I didn't want to give up on that. And I was afraid that I would end up just being this robot, android, cyborg kind of Christian man who walked around all the time and asked people if they knew the Lord and said, praise the Lord. And I just didn't want to be like that. I had this fear I was going to lose me. So some people don't find Christianity appealing because either they know they could never be like all the people they see in the church, or else they know they don't want to be like all the people that they see in the church. So many of us are trying to act as if we have it all together. We're trying to act like we are supposed to act rather than how we really are. We're all about the show. It reminds me of a... uh, I'm going to show my age here. A show from a long time ago called Laverne and Shirley. And one time, one time Laverne saw some guy with a real fancy uh, hanky sticking in his coat pocket. She said, that's a, fa- a fancy hanky. He said, yeah. She said, is that for showing or for blowing? You see, sometimes what we do is just for showing. It's not really for being used. It's just for looks. We want everybody to see it, but it doesn't really serve any purpose. God doesn't call us just to be all about the show. But can you believe that God actually values your uniqueness? God loves you in the way that He made you. Rather than fully becoming the person that you are called to be, many of us are are content to just run with the pack. I'm running with the pack, as Bad Company once sang. Because when we run with the pack, there's a certain amount of security in that. And it it can even mean that we lose ourselves. We lose our strengths and our gifts because we're, we're just content to be enclosed and safe with the pack mentality to that uniformity that comes from trying to blend in with everybody else. Well, the truth is, if we would be aware of our uniqueness, if you could fully identify and be aware of your strengths, and your weaknesses, and if you would dedicate that all to God and say, all that I am, God, I give to You. All to Jesus I surrender. That He would be able to do great things with everything that You've given Him. And your faith could grow and be vital and it could be strong. And you could feel God's unconditional love rather than feel as if you are trying to fit into somebody else's mold of what you should look like. To feel God's love and to feel free to be yourself, now that's freedom. Galatians 5.1 says it is for freedom that Christ has called us to be free. So we need to allow God to transform us. That's the word I want you to think about for a minute. God is, wants to transform us rather than conform us. Now, it's Sabbath and it's church and I'm behind the pulpit, which means that I've got to read the Bible. So I need to ask my, my family in the church. There's only nine of us in my church family listening and all those listening, is it all right if I read my Bible in church? Or on the internet? They can't take that away from me yet. All right, so turn in your Bible or flip open your phone, your smartphone or your flip phone, or uh, look on a tablet, or maybe you've memorized it. Romans chapter 12. I've got the time this morning. And there was a couple things in there I wanted to note, so I'm going to read the whole entire chapter. It is only 21 verses. Romans chapter 12. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, there is one word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now the rest of this is just for your edification. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now check out this passage about spiritual gifts, the way God has given gifts to people so that you are an individual. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the ones who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Then there's this beautiful home run for the rest of the chapter. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Isn't that a great passage? Outdo one another. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That's one of my ministry verses. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That's a good word. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Come on, preacher. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Isn't that a great verse? Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, or I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's a great verse. When you have somebody that's in conflict with you, go out of your way to be even nicer to them. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's Romans chapter 12. It's at the very beginning that I want to focus on. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And that word transformed, it's an interesting word. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. So that means to change into another form, to transform, to trans, to transfigure. It's the same word used about Jesus in Matthew 17 when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. It says right before their eyes, he was transformed. He was metamorphosized. He was transfigured. He changed from one thing to another. So God, Romans 12 says, let God transform you. Let him take who you are and let him make that into the best version of you. Don't be conformed to the world. That word means to, to fashion or shape one thing like another. That's to let the, the, the forces outside of you make you into something that they think is what you should be made into. Now there's a lot of pressure. There's social pressure. There's peer pressure. There's pressure from your work, from your family, from society. Talk about peer pressure. That's the way many of us have been living for the past month or so. Keep six feet apart. Now it's wear a mask. And now, and now all of this virus stuff has gotten back into, it's somehow become politicized. And, and are you a patriot or something? Or are you ready to go back to work? Should we stay socially apart? And all at once now, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people trying to conform you to one thing over the other. But the Bible tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and not be conformed by the world. Very appropriate, relevant texts for us today, living in this time of virus. So let God do the molding and the shaping and the crafting, starting from the inside. Don't let others, no matter how sincere they are or helpful they appear to be, conform you from the outside. God's changes 
start from the inside of you. God comes into your heart and comes into your life. And from that then, the outside changes. You have to start with the inside and then it works its way outward. Inside, new change creates outside new behavior. And how sad that some people never come to trust Christ because they don't realize that God's love is individualized for them and personal for them. They never come to that sweet, liberating understanding that God calls us to faith and He wants us to come just as we are. God's family is big enough for you. God's love is wide enough for you. It's deep enough. It's complete enough for you even if you don't look like any preconceived notion of what a believer should look like. Come as you are. Come as you are as an individual. God accepts you as an individual. He works with you as an individual. You can trust with Him. You can live your life through the Holy Spirit's leading and let Him guide you. If you willingly and truthfully and honestly submit yourself to God, then He will take what you are and make it into the best version of yourself Casting off those things that are weighing you down, things that aren't of God, maybe it's hatred or anger, those kind of things, making you more of a great person that people want to be around, that He can use. God loves us as individuals and He created us to be unique. Each of us has a unique place and purpose in the family of God and in this world. Now the Bible, if you read it, it's full of amazing people that God has used. It's, it's amazing to look at the people that God has chosen to use in this world. It's like God went through all the used car lots in America and in the world and picked out these uh, cars for Him to use to create His, His 12 disciples in the Bible and all the people in the Bible and all the people in the world. It's like some people were, were Volkswagens and Ford Pintos and Humvees and Studebakers and Mustangs and BMWs, or I always felt like I was an AMC Rambler, if anybody remembers that car. We had one when I was a kid growing up, or even a Yugo. Of course, some of you, you feel like you're, you're Porsches, and maybe you are, or Lamborghinis, or even a Plymouth Aztec. Look at the 12 disciples. They had a fisherman and a zealot. A zealot was like a, a radical, a subversive. One of them was a zealot. Fishermen, tax collectors. Why Jesus drove the, why Jesus chose the twelve people he chose, I I don't know. But maybe he just wanted to show that God looks at each one of us through our sickness, through our weaknesses, and he says, I can use you. He has a role for each one of us just as we are. He knows how to smooth out the rough edges. He knows how to surgically remove those dark, corrupt sections of our personality. You need to let Him do that. You need to let Him come in and be the, the, the grand physician, the divine physician. He sees what we can be through grace underneath the sickness, underneath the shame, underneath the virus, underneath the pain. When He looks at us, He doesn't see the sickness and the pain. He sees the person that you are. He sees His child and He loves you. I want to tell you a story in closing. So, I'm getting ready to close. So for those of you that are at home and maybe you got lunch ready, you might want to go in and either turn on the oven or turn on the burner or call Jimmy John's and order a couple subs delivered. Whatever it might be, I'm in the home stretch now. I want to tell you a story about the best cat that ever lived. And that cat's name was Zandy. Z-A-N-D-Y. I named that cat. Thank you. Zandy was our very loud Siamese cat that we had for 18 years. We got this cat in 1996 and she died in 2014. Now, I had never had a pet from beginning to end from puppy to dog to kitten to cat. Never in my whole life. And we loved her. When we got her, the boys were little and she was part of the family. And when she got old and started having problems, problems that were causing her to suffer, we made the difficult decision to put her down. I had never had to deal with that before. It was a very sad, strange day to arrange 
for this to happen, I had to call the vet and say, I would like to make an appointment to bring my cat in and have you put her to sleep, is a nice way we say it, for you to, to kill her. So we, we took her in. We waited in a room as they prepared injections to sedate her and then put her to sleep. So we're in this room, and they take her out of the room, and they put in an IV in her arm, her leg, and then they bring her back into us. And so then Vonnie, my wife, is holding her. And as we're sitting there, waiting for the doctor to come back in, he's then going to inject through the, the IV site that they put in. As my wife was holding Zandy in her lap, I looked at Zandy trying to memorize her one more time. She was much thinner, of course, than she ever had been. Her eyes had a film over them from being dehydrated. Her fur looked bad. She was weak. She didn't look like the same healthy, happy, loud kitty that we had had for 18 years, which is why we had to put her down, because she wasn't the same. And as I looked at her in her condition, I had this moment of clarity. It was one of those divine moments that I've always remembered, and now I'm sharing it with you. I realized at that moment, as I looked at her, that I didn't see a sick, dying, thin cat. I saw my Zandi. I saw her. I saw the kitty I loved. The kitty I loved. I saw her essence, who she was. I saw her loudness and the way she would go sit over there. And when you open the door, she'd always be sitting right there. And the way she always wanted to be near us, but not necessarily on her lap. And the way she'd run away when somebody she didn't know came in the house. I looked at her, and I didn't see a sick, dying kitty. I saw a cat. I saw someone, a member of my family that I love. And I cried when we put her to sleep. It was so odd to see her die in our arms and then stand up and hand them back, hand her back to them, and then have to pay them to do that. But the thought that came to me after I saw her and realized how much I loved her is I thought, this is how God sees us. He doesn't see us as good or bad or even happy or sad or sick or well or rich or poor or black or white or male, or female, He sees us. When He looks at us, He sees us. He sees us frail, and fractured, and fallen, and foibled, and He says, I love you. So I think when God looks at us, He sees His children. He sees the essence of who we are. He made us. He redeemed us. He loves us. He knows us no matter how we are. He loves us any way, any how, anywhere. There's nothing I can do to end that love. What a miraculous, undying, unrelenting love that is. And it fills the heart to overflowing. And that's why people are drawn to God. So in thinking about that again for myself, I long and pray to see people as God sees people. I long for God's vision to see things as He sees them with compassion, with clarity, with love. If I can see my cat, Zandy, that way, I'm so thankful for a grace-filled God who sees us that way, who loves us for who we are and calls us to be more than that. And so, friends, as I get ready to close, I can smell, I can smell lunch cooking. You can invite me over later when the quarantine's over. Remember that God made you. God sees you. God loves you. And health in this time of virus is not just being real, but it's also being unique. Being fully you. And when you are fully alive in Christ, then you are fully alive forever. Being fully you brings glory to God. The glory of God is man and woman fully alive. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank You for Your grace and Your mercy that You poured out to us in Christ. And I pray in His name that each one will see how unique they are in His sight, how much He loves each one of us as we are. May we be blessed. May we trust Him. May we come to Him. 
May we accept him and live with our hearts full to become the men and women he calls us to be uniquely and fully us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today will be 633, when we all get to heaven, 633, the first, second, and last stanza. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout for victory. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout for victory. Amen. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear kind and wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so happy for this beautiful Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. We're so happy, Lord, that you have given us another opportunity to fellowship together, even though it's remotely, to once again turn our eyes to you, to count our blessings, to have opportunities to show gratitude and love for each other and for you. Dear God, as we get ready to start a new week, we invite you into our hearts and our homes. We ask that you will continue to shower us with your protection, your grace, your love, and your mercy. Help us, God, to in these difficult times to not lose hope but to keep our eyes ever fixed on you and thoughts of finally getting to heaven as our home. Bless us as we go and help us, Lord, to be all that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We thank you for joining us and see you next week.